Okay, so um, shoot, uh, got it, and back there we go. So today we're going to cover early spring for the bees. We've, we, if it's, it was feeling like spring for a little while. And now it kind of feels like we suddenly got thrown back into winter, but the bees are still getting ready for spring, even, even in this cold. So we're gonna talk about um, feeding and why it's so important to feed in the spring and, and kind of what's going on inside of your hives with the colonies um, so that you can really, really understand on a deep level why it's so important to feed bees in the spring. We're also gonna talk about yellow jackets and how to get ahead of yellow jackets so you don't get overwhelmed in August. And we'll talk a little bit about equipment maintenance. I actually did have on here a little bit about diagnosing dead outs until I realized that's what the speaker today, today was gonna to talk about. So this is good because I was worried I was going a little too deep into some of these subjects. Um, so we'll have a little more time for them. So, um, we're going to start with the really simple stuff about transitioning from winter feeding into spring summer feeding and then we'll we'll go into some of the mechanics about why feeding is so important so right now the daily temperatures are still below 55 degrees somewhere around 50 to 55 degrees the bees are clustered up tightly and uh, they don't move around in the in the hive as much and even more importantly, anything that is inside of the hive that's introduced is going to be cold. So if you put syrup, cold syrup in that hive, it's gonna take them so much energy to warm up that syrup to access the food that it's really detrimental. So do not feed syrup until the temperatures are above 55 degrees. If you start seeing lots of bees flying, then that's a pretty good indication that it's warm enough to feed uh, syrup. Um, you wanna make sure to take quick peeks um, under the lid when it's a slightly warmer day, you wanna peek under there. Um, and I, even if I think my colonies have a lot of honey available, I just give them sugar patties anyway. Um, they seem to preferentially eat the sugar and then I can maybe have a little bit more honey to, to, um, to extract, or if they wanna eat the honey, they've got lots on there. I just always um, feed uh, sugar cakes or dry sugar um, in the winter and early spring. Um, so what I do is I lift the lid and if I see a whole bunch of bees on top like this and that sugar patty is almost gone, then I stick another sugar patty in there. Or um, if I'm doing dry sugar, I put down a fresh piece of newspaper and pour some dry sugar on top of that directly on the frames. If you are doing a subsequent feeding of the dry sugar, um, what they do to get to it is they eat little holes through the newspaper to get up into the dry sugar and eat the dry sugar. So with each new feeding of dry sugar, you kind of have to put a little fresh piece of paper on there. Otherwise, when you pour the sugar on, it pours through the holes and you'll get a lot of, um, don't ask me how I know this this year. <laughs> you'll get a lot of dry sugar um, on your uh, mite board, uh, under your screen board. Um, it's also really important to add pollen patties this time of year. Um, pollen is what they feed the brood, and it's also the protein source that, that is available to them inside of the hive in the winter. I try and start feeding pollen patties around February 15th. Valentine's Day, the bees start getting pollen patties. You don't want to give them pollen patties earlier than that because um, it'll give them dysentery within the, within the hive. So this is the feeding that we've been doing. Um, I'm hoping that by the time we get to the next meeting, we're going to get some temperatures where we're starting to get above 55 degrees. We'll be getting closer to being able to do um, sugar syrup. And so um, what you wanna do is you wanna mix your sugar syrup one-to-one -one by volume. It doesn't have to be exact, kind of a scoop of dry sugar and an approximately the same scoop of water. I use hot tap water, the hottest tap water that will come out of my faucet. Um, do not boil your syrup on the stove. It converts the sugars and can make the bees sick. So just using um, hot sugar, hot water and dissolve the sugar feed them continuously. If you've got a new hive, this is your first year or you have new hives, plan on feeding them nonstop through the entire year. They use that syrup to raise brood, 
to draw wax. There is a lot that goes into a brand new hive to make a strong colony. And it's not just feeding the bees for energy, it's all of the building that they have to do within the hive. So feed continuously if you have a new hive. Um, and even established hives, pay attention to the blooming of your flowers and the ones that provide nectar. So uh, in first flowers we often get that are really visible in the spring are dandelions. There's lots and lots of pollen in dandelions, maybe not as much nectar. Um, so you really want to kind of keep making sure that they have enough food in the hive until the uh, blackberries start blooming. That's our first major flow in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so if I had a new hive, I would, I would feed continuously all year. On my established hives, um, I would keep an eye on them. I might continue um, keeping some dry sugar on them or maybe even give them a little bit of syrup right up until when the blackberries bloom. Unless you pull out frames and you can see frames that are still loaded with honey, um, then, then you're probably fine not feeding them. Although they say that the sugar syrup is stimulates um, brood and stimulates wax. So even if you have honey in the frames for them to eat, it's not quite as exciting to the colony as the idea of everything's blooming and nectar's coming in and we need to build up the, um, make lots of baby bees to go out and forage for all of this nectar. So um, feeding sugar syrup in the spring is very stimulating to colony growth. Um, and then I would discontinue the pollen patties on established colonies when the dandelions bloom. Um, and I would feed pollen patties uh, year round to a new colony. Um, there are increasing reports of small hive beetles um, out there. So um, pull up a picture of what a hive beetle, hive beetle looks like. If you think you have them, just give little tiny pieces of pollen patty at a time and feed them more frequently. Um, hive beetles love those big pollen patties. And then when there's a lot of it on the hive, then you tend to get more, more of them. It's not really established here yet. I just keep hearing rumblings uh, here and there of more hive beetles showing up. So now this next um, slide has a lot of colors and a lot of complexity to it, but I think it's really important to help understand um, why we need to feed bees in the spring. Oops. Oh, uh, Don, actually, I added one in. Do you want to, yeah. Don? Do you want to take some questions, or or how did you want to do that? I see a bunch of questions coming in the chat, and I saw Kathy starting to jump in and answer questions. Uh, but I can also okay. I think what. I, th I think I'd like to, let me get through the next two slides and then we'll pause and take some questions. I wanna kind of get all the way through. Um, and so if you've got a question and you've got a memory like mine, write it down <laughs> so you don't forget, but let me do two more slides and then we'll, um, then we'll cover it. And the complex slide is the next one. Um, but first I wanna talk about the bees in the hive and the food needs of the different uh, ages of the bees in the hive. So um, when they're eggs, no feeding is necessary. Eggs, eggs don't eat. They eat their, sh uh, it, they, when bees are in their eggs, they kind of eat their shell. Um, there's no feeding needed. Open brood. When you pull open your frame and you see larva in there uh, pooled up in the bottom of that cell, they need a lot of food and a lot of energy. It takes a tremendous amount of resources for the colony to raise brood. Then next, when there's capped, there, there, no feeding is needed for capped brood. So that's a much more um, energy efficient type of, of bee to have in the, in the colony. And then house bees are the little baby bees that are running around doing all the chores in the house that have not gone out and become foragers yet. They eat a lot and they don't bring in any food. So there's a lot of mouths to feed. And then foragers during the summer, they can feed themselves. They can go out in the field and feed themselves. But in the winter, they have to be fed from the resources that are within the hive, from their winter stores. So of these five types of bees, three of them in the winter need to be fed within the colony and there's no flowers yet. So one more slide. So this is a Randy Oliver slide and his slides are always so colorful and so informative, but they kind of take a minute to get your head around. So what we're looking at here is the average age of bees in the colony by month. So we're kind of here 
February, almost, almost into March. The blue shaded colors are older bees. These are bees that are three or four months old. And the brighter flame colors here are young bees. These are the, the vigor of, of the young bees. And so as you can see, we've been going along through January and February, and the average age of these bees, this number right here is slowly increasing. We've got lots and lots of old bees in the hive, very little young brood. Not, not a whole lot of food needs other than what's, what they went into with the winter. But this line here, this dotted line is really telling. This is brood brood that has not emerged yet, that requires a lot of feeding within the hive. So you can see here in March, that queen takes off and it takes off kind of slowly at first and then just shoots up exponentially. So although you can't see it in the number of bees in the hive yet, there is a tremendous food need within the hive going on in April and May. Our, our blackberries don't come in until mid-June. So we've got all this growth of bees, all this growth of brood, and no forage out there yet. And last year there were, um, because we had such a funny uh, spring last year, there was a lot of reports of um, colonies starving to death in May. So that's just, this is just kind of a nice, uh, a nice graphic on the importance of making sure to feed. So um, I'm going to let folks just kind of look at this because I, I just enjoyed really looking at this. I found it fascinating. And the article is up here. If you want to snip this out and go and see um, Randy Oliver's article on um, feeding, it was very interesting. So um, Magali, do you want to shoot me some questions now? Or I think, uh, Sign, did you have, I, I thought I saw your hand up. Oh, I could actually thinking, unmute yourself. Yeah, I did. Um, so I was just asking uh, whether when you crack open in winter to feed, you know, you're just going in and out quickly, whether you use smoke. Um, no, I do suit up because I hate getting stung. Um, <laughs> so I do, I do put at least a, a, a mask on, but um, I don't, I try not to stress the colony in the winter by um, adding smoke and it's such a quick peek and I'm not pulling out any frames. All I'm doing is I take off the brick. I've got a big rock on top of the hive. I take off the outer cover. I take off the inner cover and all of the um, quilt boards. And then I get down to that very last uh, quilt board. And then I just take a quick peek. And if I have to feed them, I pour some sugar in, and I put it back right away. So you really don't need smoke in the, in the early spring. Melissa? Uh, yes. So if you're really not seeing any activity, are, do you just assume that, that there was a die off? Yeah, generally this time of year, there is um, some bees coming and going. Right. Um, when the sun comes out and that sun hits your hive, there is a test that you can do. It's not recommended to do it very often, but if you put your ear up against the colony and you give it a whack, you'll hear a oh. zzz as, as you kind of upset them. If you can't hear any noise and you don't see any bees coming and going, then it's it's possible that you that you lost your colony. I've got one, um, one dead out that I lost, uh, I think during the big freeze, which was a shame. It was a really strong colony and it just kind of, um, but it had an older queen um, that pooped out and that one has no bees coming and going at all. And all of the rest of the colonies have bees coming and going. Um, but this is where you wanna go in. If you're checking uh, for food and you lift that top cover and you don't see any bees, um, right. it, there's a pretty good chance that, that they all just died off. And yeah. fortunately, we're gonna get a really good lecture today on how to figure out what happened and how to um, go forward and maybe not lose bees for at least for the same reason next year. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Was there any others? So I'm, um, I'm not seeing any other hands. Magali, is there? No? Okay. No, I did see some uh, questions about, well, the, about the chart actually. Are you confirming that this is from Manitoba? It seems to be saying that it clearly seems to be a colder place than Seattle given how late the buildup is. 
Well, yeah, and you know, I was looking at that too. Um, it does seem like ours would be, uh, my guess is we're probably around mid-March on this, may, or maybe, you know, we're, we're, we're a little further along on the chart than, than what this is showing, probably from a colder place. Um, so the, the buildup has probably begun already. It's just at a very low level. So what happens with the buildup is um, there needs to be a certain number of nurse bees to tend to and keep the brood warm. So the queen will start out and she'll lay a small patch of bees and those will um, emerge and she'll have a, a broader group of nurse bees to help raise more brood. So her next round, she'll start laying more bees and then she'll get a larger group of nurse bees to take care of the baby bees. And that's where you see this exponential um, increase. So right now we're, we're I, I wouldn't know how many rounds they, it takes them to get to maximum strength, but, um, but we're, I think we are a little further along than where this chart would imply. Thanks. Um, I, I had a I had a question that I think is a is a classic question actually up there uh, that was talking about feeding sugar water or dry sugar throughout the year and whether that could compromise the honey uh, if you're trying to eat your honey. That's a that's a great question. Yeah. Um, if you feed sugar water to your bees while they're making honey, then it's fake honey, or I think Tracy calls it funny honey. <laughs> so it's called funny, fake honey. Um, and so um, that's actually perfectly okay for you to eat. There is nothing wrong if you, if, if you got a whole ton of honey and you just want to take like one, one little frame in your first year, oopsie, you could probably do that, um, but you can't sell it. You can't call it pure honey. Um, so be careful when you are getting to the point of where you're extracting that, um, you're not feeding at the same time. Okay. So I'm going to move on here so we don't run out of time. Um, so next we're going to talk about yellow jackets. Um, believe it or not, the bees are planning for August right now, and we need to plan for August right now also. And what we often get in August is yellow jackets harassing our bees. Yellow jackets are solitary bees, similar to bumblebees, only the queen overwinters. So the, uh, in the fall, the hives throw out queens, they get mated, and the queens find a dry, warm spot to overwinter the bark of a tree or the side of a house. And as soon as the weather starts warming up in the spring, generally in March, the bees start coming out, the queen bees start coming out of their warm spaces and seeking out nesting places. Now, similar to the honeybees, they build up slowly. They lay a few eggs, they get some nurse bees, they lay a few more. So the buildup is really slow. So although they've been there the whole time, we don't actually start noticing them until the numbers get so high in August and they come starting to hunt our bees that we really start noticing them. But they are there now. The queen bees are a little larger. The queen yellow jackets are a little larger than a regular yellow jacket. And um, I've had really good success with this type of uh, trap. It's a pheromone trap. So it does not attract the honeybees but it does attract the yellow jacket queens. And I'll off, I'm, I live out in um, rural Skagit Valley and I'll often catch 20 queens per trap in, um, in these. And, and last year I put them out too late. I couldn't, I, I couldn't find them. My bee stuff wasn't organized yet and I got them out too late. And um, all of the yellow jackets nested in my neighbor's roof. It was a really big problem last year. So I put my traps out last weekend <laughs> And the pheromone bait lasts for about six to eight weeks. Um, so you can always refresh it once more if you want um, before we get to spring. But every queen you catch um, is one, an entire nest of yellow jackets that's prevented. Are we doing it? And then um, moving on to the next subject. Did anybody have questions on yellow jackets before we move on? We have one hand raised. Yeah, oh, okay. I, I did. Um, so we put these out. We had a really big yellow jacket problem in August. Um, I almost suspected that might be what happened to our bees. 
but we put these out, two of them out, but they never, they didn't seem to catch any. So do you, I've also seen like homemade, like hot dog ones or something. Mm -hmm. Are yeah, those... and the, the, challenge, the challenge with yellow jackets is you really have to get ahead of them. If you're trying to capture and kill 60,000 yellow jackets or you know 20,000 yellow jackets that are in a single nest, it's really going to be an uphill battle. These are pheromone traps that are intended to attract the queens more than the workers. So this is what you want to use in the spring to prevent yellow jacket nests. In the fall, if you get yellow, if your neighbor gets yellow jackets or they're they, they're in the area, um, it's not it's not an approved method. But a lot of the forest services use um, fipronil which is um, frontline pet flea medicine mixed into a can of cat food. And oh. um, the yellow jackets like the meat, they care and it's, it's um, you wanna protect it so the squirrels aren't getting into it and getting a, a bad dose of it, but it's safe for animals. Um, and they'll carry the meat laced with the fipronil back to the hive and feed it to the hive and it and it eradicates the hive. So um, it's not FDA approved, but the state agencies are publishing papers on how they do it and how far apart they put the traps. So I think it's okay to talk about here. <laughs> okay, I just, I even though I saw wasps, I never saw them in our wasp catcher that looked like yours, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just not a fan of catching wasps. I just, yellow jackets, I just don't think you can catch enough of them to make a difference because there are, by the time you see them and they're a problem, there are so many of them. Um, so right. get ahead of them in the spring. If you still get them in the fall, use uh, Fipronil or like you said, the hot dog 7-Up trap, the sugar meat combination, you're more likely to catch them. But this is a springtime trap, not a, an autumn trap. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the last subject here is um, equipment. So um, we're also getting ready for the bees. It's really exciting to get ready for the bees at, um, next year. And so you wanna make sure that all of your uh, boxes have been scraped out on the inside if you've got extra boxes. Um, you want to make sure that if um, they haven't been painted in a few years or if they've never been painted, that um, that you're painting the outside only. Oh, yeah, yeah, paint. Oh, I sorry, this is a typo. This says paint inside only. That's wrong. <laughs> you want to paint the outside only. Uh, um, you want to take a look at your stored um, combs of wax and you want to cull out old wax and uh, make sure that your frames are ready for the year. You wanna make sure that you have extra equipment. Even if you only run a single um, hive, you always wanna try and stay one, um, one box ahead of your hive. So that means you've got a bottom board, a box with some frames and a lid. And that way, if your hive needs to be split or if you get a swarm or any number of things, then, um, then you have some place to put them. So sometimes it's a little bit of a challenge at first and can be a little expensive um, keeping ahead of the, the equipment needs for your bees. Although I have seen people put them in uh, coolers. <laughs> there are, there's emergency equipment you can use, um, but it's, it's good to stay one box ahead. Um, if you're gonna try and do swarm traps, now is the time to uh, get your swarm traps ready, get your swarm commander or your lemongrass or, or whatever it is that you'd like to have to try and catch swarms. Um, buy extra sugar. Um, a couple of years ago when we went into COVID and everywhere ran out of sugar, it was really stressful. In January and February, there was no sugar in the store. So I do try and stay a couple bags ahead of what I need. I'll, I'll mix up for my for my colonies, I mix mix it up by the 25 pound bag at a time. And so I always try and stay one bag ahead. And then um, if, you, if you're new, take a beginner class. We offer three of them here, tons of information, so helpful. 
Um, and if this is your second or your third year, then take a minute to kind of go back um, and remember the things that you're going to need for this year. Just kind of think month by month through the year. Um, draw out a plan. Um, are you going to try and do splits? Are you going to buy some new packages? Um, and then remember, whatever you plan is likely to change because <laughs> that's, that's the nature of beekeeping. Um, Oops, oh, this is where I was going to talk about dead outs, which I don't have to. I'm, I'm really actually happy I don't have to talk about dead outs. <laughs> um, and so um, looking forward to next time at PSBA, we're going to be in spring. We're going to be welcoming all the bees in the springs. We're going to talk about how to install packages, which is about the most fun you can have in beekeeping is, is handling packages and, and new nukes. So we get to get to go into the joy of spring next meeting. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dawn. That was awesome. I love that picture of the um, single file of all the pollen, those four bees in a row. Those are beautiful. <laughs> right above the, um, uh, above the flowers. Uh, well, that was perfect because it's you're a minute early. Um, and thank you very much. Um, so I would like to do a little bit of a business intro um, with regard to PSBA and give you everyone a little update about what's cooking with the club and um, and then introduce you to the um, honey suppliers that we have this year that will take a moment to talk about what they have to offer you um, since there are so many people that are interested in buying um, uh, bees for their for this upcoming spring um, and from there we will step into Dr. Dare, um, Dr. Carey, Dr. Dewey Karen, who is, as Dawn said, is gonna talk about necropsy, which is very exciting. Um, so um, let's see, PS, welcome to the meeting. Thank you for being here. Um, Puget Sound Beekeepers Association is a nonprofit 501c3, which means that everything we do relies on volunteers. And we are um, uh, honestly coming out of the pandemic, it feels, pretty exciting to say that we're, um, I'm hoping to be able to find work and welcome new volunteers to get involved again. Um, it's been challenging to incorporate people when we aren't in person, but the plan is to move into the Center for Urban Horticulture and have um, personal meetings again, beginning in April, so a month after next at the University of Washington. And it is our goal to simultaneously offer the Zoom recording, the Zoom meeting that, so people, I think we just gotten used to the convenience and a lot of people may be preferring that. Personally, I can't wait to be back in a room with beekeepers and have the energy that we do generate and uh, the passion that we all share. And really that's my favorite part and I've missed it so much. So I hope to see lots of people come back to be together. Um, we will ask for masks and, um, you know, do good things to help people feel safe. Um, so we do have beginner beekeeping classes available to, um, for uh, people to sign up. There's one coming up in a couple of weekends and then three weeks later, a second. The first one is with Dawn and that is on March 5th and 6th. And it is, it's gaining a lot of momentum. Tracy's is starting to catch on um, and get, get pretty, pretty busy too. Um, Tracy Klein teaches the second beginner class and that's on the 26th and 27th of March. So they're nicely spaced apart. And um, along with their teaching, um, which is of course virtual, there are uh, two people supporting their efforts at teaching that keep a lot more uh, personal engagement. There's a chat room and um, the questions are in constant flow and that's manned by Kathy, Kathy Cox. And then Mogley is along to help out too. And she's talking with anyone who's having any trouble with their technology and She's helping Kathy too, um, doing a little bit more of the admin side of the class. So um, it feels intimate with their backup. You know, the teacher can be a lot more um, progressive moving through the material. Um, 
I didn't mention that in terms of seeking volunteers and hoping to get people more involved again, um, that we would love someone who would like to get involved uh, updating our website. And um, so if that's something that you have time and energy for, that would be a wonderful contribution to the club. Um, oh, uh, importantly, um, let's see, Tim Hyatt, who is the Washington State Beekeepers Association legislative captain, chair, sorry, his legislative chair. He is going to step in at the end of the meeting after Dr. Karen and speak about two issues that we have. The survey that's been issued to beekeepers to fill out, which is um, very challenging to understand the wording. I think it's intentionally um, hard to read. I don't really know how to answer it myself and I'm very clear how I feel. So hopefully he can shed some light on that because he's been very involved through the whole process. Um, and then there's also additionally new information I have is that um, there is the, the city of Bothell is interested in establishing beekeeping uh, criteria and creating some laws. And they are interested in beekeepers to give feedback. And Tim is reaching out for Bothell people to get involved. So if anyone is interested in that subject, he can shed some light on that after he talks about the survey if people want to stick around, if you may be from Bothell. Um, and with that, I would love to, uh, oh, lastly, we have our board meeting on Thursday night and I welcome members to join us. Um, everyone is welcome. And if you'd like to get the um, access to that meeting or have any other concern, like, in, like you'd like to tell me how you feel about a live meeting happening or want to volunteer, um, I can be reached at president at PugetSoundBees.org or Kay Hyatt, K-H-I-A-T-T -T at PugetSoundBees.org, okay? Um, so now um, I'm not sure, is Maureen, are you going to introduce your, your stalwart list, your group of, um, I see um, Peter and Amy Beth are here, so we can kick off with you guys and um, I don't know who else might be present. Jason, you, Jason and Dave are here too. Here. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Okay, well, <laughs> um, I would love to um, be able to offer question and answer. So time for that, if there is any uh, feedback or interaction from members and um, allow, so you're saying, you think Peter, there's just two people present tonight? Uh, us, Dave and Jason, I, oh, I, see, thank I you. see three of us here. Three, okay. Yeah. so if. If you, it's hard to say everything in a short amount of time, but we'll try and keep be finished by 7.30 if that's possible. Thank, Thank you very much. Cool. Well, I'm unmuted, so I will go first. Uh, my name is Peter. Uh, my company is Rainy Day Bees. I am selling Nucleus Hives produced by Randy Oliver, who you heard uh, Don quote a little bit in the beginning beekeeping class. Uh, the company is Golden West Bees. It's run by Randy and his sons. Um, they're great Nucleus Hives. I've been using them myself for, I think this will be my seventh year picking them up. And at the beginning, I was keeping them all for myself. Now I'm selling almost all of them. I just keep, you know, a few for myself. Um, but they're great nucleus hives. What I like about Randy's bees, he, while it, they are from California, it's Northern California, uh, he's located in the foothills of the mountains down there. And so the bees do, even though they are California bees, they do actually experience weather. They get some snow, they get rain, they get, you know, all the things that we get up here, um, which I think makes them do a little bit better here than something from Southern California, for example. Um, or even from the lowlands. That does because the queens are mated um, up in the mountains. Uh, the mating can um, be just a little bit later than if you were getting something from SoCal or Hawaii or, uh, or even the lowlands, uh, you know, in the Bay Area, because um, it's just a little bit more weather dependent and they wanna make sure that they're selling us um, great, great nukes with great queens. Um, when did I forget? 
there was one other thing that was important. Um, you wanted to talk about race and what they're bred for. I did really want to quickly want to, thank that. you. People <laughs> do ask me this. what race the bees are. Um, they, the, the Olivers are a pretty small um, producer, uh, especially compared to, you know, the large, com large producers. Uh, so they do not uh, focus on racial purity in their breeding operation. They uh, select for gentleness. Um, the Olivers largely work uh, even without a veil. Um, shorts and sandals. Short sandals and Hawaiian <laughs> t-shirt. That's Randy. Um, <laughs> uh, gentleness, productivity, health, mite resistance. Um, they've been going pretty hard on trying to breed for mite resistance for a while, but um, that's always hit and miss no matter where you get your bees from. Um, that's it. I think that's it. $250 plus tax, $275 total. Uh, you can get them on my website, which I am going to post right now. And pickup is in Shoreline or Carnation? Just Shoreline. Great. We're Thanks. Just Shoreline. Hi, I guess I'll go next. Um, this is Jason Cardong from. Um, I run a Woodland Bee Company out of Ballard here in Seattle. Um, and I've, um, I'm selling packages now. I've sold out of nukes already. Uh, everybody wants bees this year. Um, my packages are also from Northern California. And uh, it's a, a person that I've worked with for about 10 years now and had really great success with them. I'm always happy with how the queens produce and how they're acclimated to the area here. Um, and, and I sell the Italian and Carniolan. Um, I don't have Russians. And I'm looking to have the packages available on Saturday, April 16th this year. So um, that makes it convenient to pick up on a weekend. And I'm selling them for 150 plus tax right now. I'll probably will raise that rate pretty soon, but I've just kept the price low for uh, the Puget Sound Beekeepers Association people. But once that wave has kind of moved through, then I'll, I'll raise the price back up to what I normally have it at. Um, I'll keep it short so that we can all get a, a chance to talk. So I will post my link as well shortly. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna go. <clears throat> this is Dave Sheeplebein. I'm with um, Elite Honey and Bee. I used to work through Cascade Natural Honey, but we've had kind of a rebranding this year. <clears throat> we are selling uh, nukes, packages, and queens. Uh, pickup will be in Bellevue. We usually uh, come into town about when Jason was uh, talking about um, a, sat a Sunday as opposed to a Saturday, and that this year would be April 17th, but that's Easter Sunday this year. So what we're hoping to do is um, bring the bees into town a week before that on the 10th of April, a little early. Uh, that hasn't been confirmed yet because that's all dependent on California weather. Um, and then we would have a second pickup um, in Bellevue on the 24th, I think is a Sunday in April. Um, we have three races of bees, uh, New World Carniolans, uh, Caucasians, and of course, uh, the Italians. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about, um, a package is a package, but one of the things that distinguishes us um, is our new transportation boxes. And one of our goals is to not be tossing things in the landfill each year. So we reward people by bringing back their nukes and their packages to us and uh, reusing them for another year. And we reward you by giving you a rebate. So for instance, our uh, nukes with tax are $276 and we'll give you 20 bucks back if you bring the box back to us. And we give you a month to do it. And uh, we're gonna, this year for the first time, we're gonna try to anyone that has something like Venmo or Zelle or PayPal, we'll do an electronic rebate. So that will really uh, speed it up. It'll be almost instantaneous. <clears throat> rather than uh, sending you a check.
Thank you. And Kit, you're muted. I don't know if you wanted to. Uh, you you um you were very succinct. Thank you. Jason, you were nodding. It looks like you're getting rebates too to, for boxes that come back. Um sorry, no, I was nodding that I thought that was a great idea. Oh <laughs> <laughs> it is. I was nodding too. Uh okay. Um are there any questions of these guys or uh, of the of the situation generally? Yes, Sim. Um, it's signed, but I was wondering if Dave is Green River Honeybees or if you had a different link, because I'm I'm trying to put links to people as I take notes. No, I didn't say green. I said elite honey and bee, and I will uh, I'll type the URL into chat here also. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. This is Daniel. I had a question about uh, registering bees. The, do we need to register the colonies like we've done previously? Because every time I've, I've clicked on the link in the last six months, it's been a dead link. And I've tried a couple of ways to find out about a way of registering. Do we still need to do that? I just yeah. download. I just went to the WSDA site and um, downloaded the PDF off of there. And it was working. Okay. So you should be able to get the registration form. The, okay. the, state, the state still has not gotten on board with the ability to pay online. So you have to download a form. You can actually fill it out and print it out, but you still have to mail it in. It's kind of silly, but that's the way it's done. And could tell me, could someone tell me what the purpose of that is? What, what does the money go towards? Money, money goes to uh, bee research at uh, uh, Washington State. It's, it's a very good program. It's a worthwhile program. Everybody should do it. Not only because it's required, but because it has a good outcome. Excellent. And it, Thank you. it also gives you protection under the beekeeper liability uh, bill. So it's very important. <laughs> the only way that you have that protection, that we are the only state that has it, it's very exciting, um, is you do need to read, pay that $10 and register your hive. $5. Wait, or $5. Wait. It sounds like it sounds like insurance. That's okay. It is. Right? It is. What yeah. is that I mean, not, now from? it is. Now it okay. is. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does that protect what, somebody what, from? What Peter is saying is huge. That that is that's a huge law. And the person that's speaking at the end of this meeting tonight was instrumental in getting that passed in the state of Washington. Yeah. That was only what four years ago or less. Very recent. Tim Tim's online here, so he could he should be smiling. But I, I just, um, it, I, I do need to be mentioning that when I'm encouraging people to please register their hives is that there is that very um, selfish benefit to registering in Washington state. And it hasn't always been so, so it's a, it's a wonderful value. What's the beekeeper liability bill? Protected so, from what? So, um, Beekeeping and actually, I was like, Tim, do you want to <laughs> say, but beekeeping does, has not been litigated very much. And so we don't actually know, like, if someone were to, were to sue someone else, what would happen? And what this bill does is it sort of establishes. It protects beekeepers from civil liability up to gross negligence. So you can't be grossly negligent, but anything below that you have liability protection from you can't be sued if if your neighbor gets stung by a bee and says that was your bee that is not a thing anymore and it's just sorry and you do have to be following all applicable laws, laws for your area in order for that to work one of those laws as we were just talking about is that you have to register your hives hey one other question on that subject um so if i'm a second year beekeeper and i've got you know, five colonies, and then I catch some swarms throughout the year that people call me to catch. At what point do I need, and what, what's the quantity, and what point during the year do I need to say, that's the number I have that I need to register for? Um, it, it's just when you start off in the spring, they're not being that, that um, detailed. They just want you accounted for. Yeah, of course, our number of hives changes, and if you feel like you're going to have what is the breakout is one to four hives is five one to five colonies is five dollars and six to 25 is 10. So if you feel like you're going to have 10, then pay the $10, you know, but it's not, it's not, I, I don't think that's, I think you could explain yourself away. Well, in April, I had five and I don't anymore. So. Okay. Thanks. Good. Sure. I always pay more than I'm actually registering. I kind of figure that there's room to grow, but also 
it's pretty inexpensive and it's going to a great thing. So I never really mind it too much. Darn bees. <laughs> I always, I always go by my target for the year. I'm like, if I'm expect to have 50 hives, I register for 50 hives. If I expect to have 200 hives, which is what I have this year or 250, whatever it's going to be, you know, I'm like, okay, wh which bracket am I, do I think I'm going to be in this year? And then, um, you know, that's the bracket that I pay for. Yeah, it's, it's, um, whenever anybody talks about feeding pollen suppl supplements in the spring, I always think, oh, I just, I just see swarms in the sky, you know, when I, but of course, that's a good thing with they're strong, then that's what you want. You just have to really be ready for twice as many hives as you thought you started out with. Um, okay. One last, one Go last ahead. Super quick note. Just you, you all heard that like Jason already sold out of nukes, just has packages. We will start, bees are selling. So make sure you buy them in the next month. By the time delivery happens, we will all be sold out. I would say sooner than the next month. Yeah. Um, you know, buy, buy your bees as soon as possible from whoever you're buying them from. Yeah, and I would like to just note that we really do vet um, the suppliers who come to PSBA and offer to um, be a part of this program. The definitions and the kind of the, the clarification for how th these are being sold is is un united, unified. So it, it really protects new beekeepers who don't really know the difference. These guys have all stepped in to, um, you know, have some integrity around that. So um, all the details that they have signed on to are on the website. So you can see exactly what those definitions amount to and learn a little bit too. So, okay, so let's, um, it's time now to move to, um, Dr. Karen, are are you here, Dewey? Have you have you seen him, Magali? Yes. Uh, at some point, I saw Dr. Dewey Karen come in. Oh no! We were early, but that, that's a good thing. I kind of gave him warning that we we might be early. Um, there's just there's so much happening tonight. Uh, so. Um, uh this is um let's see he he he's an oh there he is you i should introduce you more more professionally but i i'm uh introduced to you in the newsletter you're uh, um professor emeritus and moved to portland to be near grandchildren and now very involved in the um the beekeeping community there and um been doing some speaking and I think you've become popular, Dr. Karen. So welcome to Puget Sound Beekeepers Association. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, let me bring up my slide. I'm going to do a PowerPoint. Um, this is being recorded so that you may uh, have a chance to return to it. All right. Let's see. Full scale. All right. I presume that this is up that you can see. Yes. All righty. I start with St. Valentine's Day, although this was last week. Many people were not as familiar with uh, the fact that St. Valentine is one of our patron saints of beekeeping. He, uh, there are many St. Valentines in the church, but the one that is recognized uh, was martyred because he was marrying people against the will of the uh, authorities. Uh, but he was also an MD, a doctor for that time, and he used honey and beeswax and also propolis in all of his treatments. And so uh, he is recognized in some circles as our one of our patron saints. All right, I'm gonna talk about uh, beehive um, this time of year. Unfortunately, we're gonna find some of them. Some of us are gonna find a lot of them um, dead. And so something that can be a benefit is to do a necropsy, um, essentially an autopsy on an animal to uh, perhaps determine what, what happened, why they did not survive. Um, and it'll be different from fall. In fall, our major factor, if you did not, you don't have a colony now alive that you did have alive in the, towards the, you know, towards uh, in the summertime in, in July, August, September, it's because of mites, generally because of mites. And the things that we should be looking for in the fall 
Uh, first and foremost is, is the disappearance of adults. Adults are disappearing much too rapidly. So we see a brood frame here, uh, medium, uh, but there are just not enough bees here, not a good enough mantle to cover the, the colony. That's a, to cover the brood of the colony. And so that's often a good sign that something is going wrong. And that's, that's mites because the mites are shortening adult life. We'll see this body brood pattern. Um, I'll show another slide a little bit later on. But instead of being a nice solid pattern where the queen has laid eggs in most cells, we get this bodiness that appears in the brood pattern. Brood patterns in fall and spring are spottier than at other times of the year. So it's a lot of these are not hard and fast rules, but as you start multiplying them, you then come up with the thought that yes, what I'm looking at here is, is a parasitic mite syndrome, the killer of our colonies in the fall. We see a brood that is not looking healthy. Um, and I'll show a slide uh, in a little bit on a healthy brood, but it's not looking healthy. A condition we call snot or crud brood. You can use your search engine to look that up. It's different from the diseases such as European fowl brood, for example, different from sac brood. Um, so it's a different appearance of a dead or dying um, uh, larva, larval uh, cell of brood. We'll see the, the cap cells, um, the cells cappings being removed and here in the lower right corner, a shot of that. So three cells here in a row, the cappings have been removed um, and we can actually see what is inside. And in the, the lower two, we'll see that what's inside is being chewed down by the bees, by the worker bees, the adult bees. So they have removed the capping. And so this isn't gonna be a young bee that's gotta live through the winter period. So that's, that's a serious condition as we start talking with our fall, fall bees. It's an indication of hygienic bees. They're detecting mites in the, reproducing mites in these cells. And they're trying to self-police, the, the worker bees are trying to self-police their, their developing bees to avoid um, additional mite reproduction. We'll see if you do, and I hope you do, take samples and, and you'll find mite numbers generally above 3%. We would call that high, 3% of the adult number. So doing a sampling and using either powdered sugar or alcohol wash of, of roughly 300 adults. You look at the cells, you'll see lights, lots of mite poop. Um, you hold the cell, the frame at an angle, not looking straight on as we are here, hold it at an angle, and you'll see this white uh, sort of glistening material stuck to the roof of the cells. That is uh, the waste product, the mite poop. Um, and then that's, a, again, you'll see that in a lot of cells. And finally, the colony could have been very good, but boom, all of a sudden it collapses. Uh, so it doesn't even get into um, the end of November this year, for example, or into November. Very sudden, very rapid loss. So this is what we call our parasitic mite syndrome, or oh, some of us are renaming it as, as uh, because we see the characteristics in brood, like such as the chewed and the poop uh, are in the, the snot brood, parasitic mite brood syndrome. So you might see either PMS, BPMS, or B, uh, uh, PMBS. So that's what we'll see in the fall. Um, and that uh, we'll see some of this again uh, uh, in some colonies in the spring, but it's, this is our, our killer in the fall. So um, with our cool wave that is now, our cold wave that's now present, we know spring is coming. We might have gone out and tapped on our colonies, um, li listening for that reassuring hum that all is okay, that they're answering us back. But, but hold on, spring is coming. We've had a little bit of taste of it already, but indeed it is, uh, it is coming. And unfortunately with that on will be some colonies that won't survive. So here's a public service announcement. Your hive is not dead until you open the box, until observed it exists in a state of superposition where it is both alive and dead. Unfortunately, we are finding way, way too many that are dead in the spring. So what has happened in the colony, since we have not been looking, we like to have our colony set up in the fall, early winter, so that the top box is a food chamber. Most of the cells, most of the cells of the frames of the top box filled with honey, whether it's two standard as shown here or a standard and a half or three half depths, whatever your configuration is. 
And the bees will then, as the nights start dripping, dipping down below into the 60s and then into the 50s, they'll set up in a cluster. So at night they will cluster and they'll set up generally between the boxes so they can communicate between the, between the top bars and the bottom bar of the top box and stay in touch with, with the honey. Now, during winter and up until roughly the 1st of January, they have been moving upwards. They've been losing bees, moving upwards, but still in contact with this, uh, these cells that are filled with honey um, in that food chamber in the top box. Uh, by now, um, particularly since we had a, a rather warmish uh, February up until this point, we uh, find that they have, many of them have reached the top of the top box along that inner cover or whatever you have at the top of your box um, and have started to spread out along the frames and taking advantage of the honey that's in adjacent frames. Although their main, when it gets very cold tonight, their, their main cluster will cluster on back to a, a much more compact uh, cluster. So this cluster will vary depending on the time of the year. So in our looking, in addition to tapping on the outside as the, la as the shot slide shows, um, when we get a nice day, a nice day here being above 50, bees in the sun, no wind, we can pull covers off and take a quick look and see where this cluster is and confirm that there still is some honey that is left in the, in the colony. And if there isn't, then we might need to do some feeding. Now, what we will find once we can get into our colonies, in many cases, this is next month. Uh, for some of us, it won't be until April is we find this Goldilocks effect. So of our surviving colonies, we will have some colonies that are too weak. We'll have some colonies that are too strong and we'll have the colonies that are just right. Goldilocks effect of, um, of Goldilocks going into the forest and going into the bear's uh, 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 cabin. Um, of course, we'd love to have them all just right um, too strong is as much as an issue as, as is too weak. So um, as we start our spring management, we're going to have to kind of determine, uh, is that a weaker colony or is that a stronger colony? Um, uh, which, ones are, which ones are just right on, right where we want them to be? And we'll then make our management decisions relative to those, um, those conditions. For example, too weak often will need a feed, um, uh, both protein and sugar syrup, and may need a boost. Uh, strong colonies where often we'll have to weaken them, that is take some bees and perhaps some brood or add some more space um, to, that, to the box or boxes that we have. Whereas the just right, we're going to have to not give up on them. We, we are going to, to have to watch them because a colony that is just right this week when we go in, the third week of March, uh, may get very strong and be a colony that then starts rearing some queen cells. So depending on, on what we find for our colonies that are the survivors, our management's going to vary depending on, on their strength um, depending on what happens from the point that we start inspecting them on through the remainder of our spring inspection period. And, and roughly we're talking then of, of April um, in and to May. Um, the March, um, March, I always talk about March is, is probably the cruelest month. It's a roller coaster month for us and our hives here in the Pacific Northwest. It's a roller coaster of our emotions, of hive conditions, new season planning, and support actions, both missed and unplanned, that we're going to try to do. Um, we have to hold on tight. It's, it, things go very quickly in colonies, particularly um, those that are just right. March is rarely a pretty month for the Pacific Northwest, uh, beekeeping except for some pollen foraging, if lucky, uh, as when we get to be all giddy and joyful as we start seeing them on our plants in the spring. Um, and they need to get on a variety of plants because some of those that are most plentiful, and I show you a picture of dandelion there, are some that are not as useful to the bees. So they actually have to have a smorgasbord. Pollen, uh, dandelion pollen is not a very good um, source for bees at, in terms of the uh, amino acids they need 
protein content's okay, but it's, it's lacking amino acids. So they have to have this smorgasbord. So the best thing we can see on a day of foraging is bees with many colors coming into our colony. That's what we want to see. Now, before I get on to our spring and our dead out uh, uh, determination, uh, I've been doing a survey here since I came to the West Coast, as you heard in 2009, um, to uh, help raise my grandkids. Uh, I've been doing survey of, of both backyarders and commercials. This includes both Oregon and Washington and also um, beekeepers in the state of, of Idaho, Pacific Northwest uh, Survey. Um, this is a trace of the last, uh, since 2015, of um, the losses of backyard beekeepers. This is the solid red line that you see up here. Numbers go up and down a bit. Um, the, the blue line is a trace, is a record of the losses of commercial beekeepers in the state of Washington. You can see the number of commercial hives that are, are roughly involved in this survey. And you can see the number of backyard beekeepers that are involved in this survey as well. The dotted lines represent the, the uh, uh, continuing losses, the, the uh, uh, running tally of the average level of losses of beekeepers. And you can see that when I have the, uh, the record from 2015 for Washington State backyarders, it was just under 50 colonies, 50% uh, of colonies. And you can see it hasn't really moved. It is still just about 50% um, uh, of the colonies. Although some years are heavier, some years are less. Um, the commercial level of losses, however, has um, not been uh, the same. It is an increasing level of loss. So you can see that, that, that when I started here, it, or when I have the record from 2015, commercial and backyarders have very, very le uh, overlapping levels in terms of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, de you know, the deviation from a norm, from an average. Um, and this past year they are as well, but normally the losses of the commercial beekeepers are about half that of the backyard beekeepers. Now this is my Pacific Northwest loss survey of 163 backyarders of Washington State and a good number from, um, from this association. Um, the other survey, and it runs the same month as the month of April, and that's been a little bit different. So these are the numbers since 2015 of the, the, the average loss of percentage loss of colonies for the participants in the bee informed survey. You can see that has crept up by the 10% in, in accord with what has happened with the commercial beekeepers. This number here is the number of losses so that uh, with three or four commercial beekeepers with 20,000 colonies, compared with 163 uh, 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 backyard beekeepers with an average number of five colonies. So you can see that um, the, the number 20,000 compared to 800 colonies, this number is from the bee informed is basically commercial level losses in the state of Washington. So you have to know that as you're reading that, uh, that particular number. I separate the two because we do a separate survey. Um, the, the, for comparison, I'm, I'm showing you the, now the uh, 12 year record of the Oregon loss. You can see there is no, was no overlap in those 12 years for the Oregon beekeepers. So the top line, the red is the Oregon backyard beekeepers. Backyard being defined here as under 50 colonies. Last year in Washington, that was up to a beekeeper with 39 colonies. And then the commercial is 50 or more. So it's what we call sideliners up to 500 colonies and commercial 500 more, that's USDA definition. Um, you can see that in Oregon, the loss back in uh, 2010 on my first year of record here was just under 20% and now it's just over 20% for the commercial beekeepers of Oregon. And this represents uh, anywhere from, depends on a year, from a third of the number of colonies to as many as two thirds of the number of colonies that we believe are in the state of, of Oregon. The backyard beekeepers, um, you can see, um, they started just under 40 and are just over 40. So again, this double the level of losses. So backyarders have double the number of losses. 
So if you read the B informed um, level of losses, remember that that is really, really a report of commercial beekeeper losses with a few um, numbers of backyards thrown in. So here's the survey, pnwhoneybeesurvey.com. Um, and I'd like to uh, encourage your participation. Here's the participation from this past year. Um, the first blue lines uh, down to the initial red line are Washington uh, groups, Washington uh, uh, bee clubs, including the, the Puget Sound. 31 individuals uh, sent in a survey from the group last year and had an average of 38% level of losses of bees. Compared to the 163 Washington beekeepers, 50, 39 or fewer counties, 37%. You know, no, no difference statistically in the two numbers. And then below that are Oregon clubs, the Oregon beekeepers of uh, 328 individuals, uh, again, up to, up to uh, 40 counties had a 35% level of loss. But among clubs, you can see there can be quite a difference. Clark County, which is the first county here along the Columbia, had 50% level of loss. The West Sound group, um, a, a large participation, 36 members sent in for surveys, had half of that, uh, even less the 23% level of loss. So too with Oregon, the Columbia County, across from um, um, the, the uh, Columbia River, 55% uh, level of loss to uh, the group that's just in one of our Portland suburbs, 27% loss. So I hope that I will have again, um, great participation from the club. Here is that information. Um, the survey is on pnwhoneybeesurvey.com. It is open in a month or no, and no, in a couple of weeks. We open it, I open it in mid-March and it goes through the month of April. Um, I then write reports about uh, the uh, state level of losses. So you can see for last year, uh, Washington state level of losses. Um, and it is losses and management. Um, I usually then also write a report for clubs. Um, I have not yet written the one for um, the, uh, the 31 individuals from the, your group, um, but I intend to do that. These are posted on the same site. Take you maybe five, 10 minutes to do the survey and all in total. And they'll be asking about losses, um, about what you then do in terms of management. And my reports are what happens in terms of management relative to uh, how, what level of losses you might have. So you might look at the Washington State report for this past year, pnwhoneybeesurvey.com. So looking at our counties this spring, we need to, to initially be aware of what, what looks like normal, um, non-disease condition, and of course, uh, still alive, whatever the strength might be. So looking at normal means looking in a brood area, and we're looking at a, a, a capped brood or the pupil stage of brood development of a frame uh, that we pulled out of our overwintering colony. The queen is, is very intent on laying eggs, very few cells are missed, and that is indicated by the, the, the openings here, or the egg that she laid for whatever reason has not reached the pupil stage. It will not uh, develop into a new bee, but pretty solid pattern. Here in the middle, the brood is hatching, uh, is coming out. The adults are coming out after they're roughly three weeks as a, as a developing brood. And you can see some that are just coming out the cells that we don't want to look at in terms of what is normal are those that are left behind. Why are these three here in the middle not yet uh, developed? And more than likely, we, if we pull that capping off, we'll see a bee just about ready to emerge uh, or would have, have emerged in a day or two. And if we look again in two, two couple days, virtually all of this will be uh, 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 half. All these uh, bees will have been emerged. So a good slug of new young bees coming into our population in spring. That's, that's what we'd like to see. Now, at this time of year, uh, hopefully we're going to see some open brood as well. So open signifies the egg or the larval stage. So the five cells here each have an egg in them. The queen lays if things are normal, normal brood, uh, normal healthy brood, 
one egg in the, roughly in the middle of the cell. It's initially sticking straight up and it's a little bit hard to see. As it gets close to melding into the larva, uh, bee eggs don't hatch. They just, uh, they just transform from the egg stage with all the developing um, cells of the embryo into the larval stage. But as they are ready to do so, they, the, so they lean over and um, are, are, are a little bit easier to see because now we're looking at, at the length of them rather looking than at the point of them. Then the first larval stage will be very tiny. It'll sit on a pool of its uh, royal jelly. Um, and we're more likely to see the jelly, the liquid in the cell than the, than the larva. You have to get the light bouncing off it just right. So these five cells here are all just newly emerged uh, from the egg of the larval stage. Um, and again, we want to see this solidness of pattern. So she put eggs in all of these cells. These eggs have, have just hatched uh, within the last uh, within the last 24 hours uh, from when we've looked. So, so looking at, at our conditions in the spring, we want to see healthy um, and, and then train our, our um, search pattern to sort of look for what isn't healthy and, and then what might be the factor, just as we will look in terms of looking at a colony, whether it's alive, what its strength is, is it weak or is it strong, et cetera, versus it's a dead owl. I mentioned a spotty pattern. So here is a, a natural comb um, started with just a, star, a strip here at the top, not yet joined to the bottom bar. But the brood pattern here is what we would certainly call a spotty pattern, not at all solid like we saw in the last uh, illustration. Um, this can be due to a number of factors, um, but um, the concern is that um, we need lots of young bees because the, in the spring colony, those are all old bees initially. We need a good slug of young bees. And if there's a very spotty pattern, as we see here, and that means the colony is, is not up to replacing those older bees. And we can have our colony die yet still in the spring when we see this pattern. And of course, the other thing we see here is there's just no adults to try to cover that. And so on a night like this, they're going to cluster. Um, they're going to get into a very tight cluster. And the brood here on the edge probably will not be kept warm enough. So this brood on the edge here just will not hatch. We need young bees. And so spotty pattern, um, uh, small adult populations. Um, work against our, our wishes here in terms of having a colony that's going to survive one and then um, begin to start to prosper as conditions improve. Okay, um, so let me look and zero in on the major factors that we might be able to um, diagnose as the reasons why our colony doesn't survive. Um, this again, um, this is being recorded so you can come back and look. And so I've listed about, uh, about a dozen different things that might be factors. I'm going to look at initially uh, colonies that um, don't have enough food and they starve or colonies that don't have enough bees and they freeze. Um, and then, then that can be due to some things that are happening in a colony. So clusters that split may then have a, a uh, too few bees and freeze, or uh, clusters um, that are, are uh, producing the um, normal amount of moisture. And we haven't done anything to help get rid of that moisture over the winter period, and too much moisture becomes our enemy. And then we're going to go on to the major factor of loss of that of mites. And I'm going to finish up uh, quickly with some other things. So looking at our spring colony, one of the things what we might find is that the bees um, ran out of food. We will often find uh, both the adult numbers and the brood numbers uh, thin or sparse. We won't often see um, uh, dead bees. Um, in some cases, in other cases, we'll see with a sudden loss, we'll see a whole bunch on the bottom board. Uh, but our key here is no honey reserves. Um, that can be confused because of evidence of robbing. Um, and a small brood area sometimes is a little bit hard to, to uh, diagnose as, as what it might be because small brood areas, small numbers of adults, particularly that move outside of their normal brood area, uh, may, may be on the same frame, but not no longer over brood but to try to stay near honey, um, just don't have enough critical mass. And so the bees then will, will freeze. 
Um, both of these are aspects that we, if we had diagnosed in a condition in the fall, we could have perhaps avoided. So this is the benefit of trying to do a necropsy in the spring. Make your notes and then, then it might help dictate what you might do this year as you prepare the bees come um, six months, uh, seven months from now. Uh, and then I'm talking about split clusters and too much moisture. So here's what these might look like. Um, on the right, um, this is uh, one of three frames that we picked out of our colony. Here's where the cluster of bees were, uh, but there is no honey. There's no honey adjacent to them. And this particular frame, um, they're up in the second box. They've, they've eaten all the honey that had at one point been in this frame and on adjacent frames. And here, an illustration from a medium box on top of a standard. So this is the medium, three medium frames on top. So there is a the bee cluster here, the bee cluster here on both sides and then here. And you can see here they had started brood. So here's a cap brood, nice solid pattern of, of cap brood, um, but no honey, no honey on these frames, um, no honey on the frames that are adjacent to this, uh, this cluster. Um, some of these bees will fall to the bottom board so that if you look on the bottom board, the bees can't keep up um, with their, their, their number of dead bees. And so this death is fairly um, rapid. And so that's why we get the bees still in the cluster location and falling to that bottom board. So this is an example of, of starvation. And our diagnostic here is, is where the bees are. Um, a good number of bees, um, they're filling up half the frame uh, and could have that, that nice pattern of brood underneath here, uh, but they starve. Um, we can get this in the fall, but not normally. It's more of the BPMS. So, so this is a spring, um, this is spring diagnosis. If we brush those bees away with our hand, with a bee brush, uh, with our hive tool, we'll see this situation. Here's the edge of the cluster because they're all tight onto each other. They didn't get brushed off but we'll see heads in, butts out. So the bees tried to get as close as they could, uh, filling each of the individual cells, um, even cannibalizing the, what brood there is um, over the top of those uh, cap brood and, and heater bees going in between the cells, but they just ran out of, of uh, fuel. Um, and again, they might be on the frame or they might be dead on the bottom. Uh, a second pattern we might see in the spring is this. Um, so here's our brood area and there's leftover brood that didn't hatch for whatever reason, cannibalized um, that condition that I showed you of, of the bees pulling cappings off, um, uh, pulling out the, um, their pupa, not letting them hatch, uh, mold in some of the cells of bee bread. But here's our cluster. So they moved off of the of the brood, moved up to the, this is a top bar here, moved up to the top bar and eating the honey immediately where they are. But then because the night got very cold, they could move over this two inches and take advantage of some honey here or some honey over in this corner of this frame here in the top box. Um, and then um, by the time we find them in spring, uh, with spring rains, et cetera, they might be a little bit moldy. Um, so this is another condition. This is not starvation. There's food. There's plenty of food here that they could utilize. Um, some cases, it's they split, and some go on to some of the cells of uh, bee bread. These are cells of, of uh, stored pollen, bee bread. Um, and, but moving off away from the brood. So this is a colony that's too small, and they just don't have the critical mass to be able to move and stay in contact with their fuel source. And so they, they die on those, that cold spell, that, those very cold nights, um, the days that they can't get out. This can happen in just a couple of days that they just can't get out and forage, you know, those wet, cold, uh, miserably cold spring days. Um, so colonies that just don't have enough adult bees. And this could be due to getting colonies started late in the year um, it could be due to uh, bees going in a couple different directions, trying to stay in touch with honey, um, two clusters, three clusters, but not uh, con uh, continuous clusters staying in touch with each other um, and just two small populations. Now, if this was all cut and dry, it'd be great. So here's a, here's a frame. This is a top box of, uh, of uh, two standards. The frame um, 
uh, uh, for the second frame in had honey. Here's some honey, um, had some stored bee bread. This is our nor ordinary frame that we'd see adjacent to a, bee a cluster. Here's a, the bees where they had reared some bee, bee brood. They still had honey in a corner. And on the third frame in, we find a bit of a cluster. Here's a bit of a cluster um, and they're rearing some brood, uh, but they went in this direction. They used all the honey that was here in this corner and because of a cold snap, couldn't move over and take advantage of the honey that was on other frames. So um, starvation likely, but starvation likely also because of too small a cluster, not enough um, critical mass of bees. So um, some of these, of these um, diagnoses, these can overlap in terms of what we might be looking at, certainly. And another factor that can complicate that is we're, if we're not looking at our colonies early in the spring, those nice days occur on days that we're at work, we can't get into our bees. Uh, and we shouldn't be going into our bees roughly if it's below 60, particularly if it's windy and not sunny, we should not be into them until closer to 70. But the bees can get into it um, on those nice days and they rot. So this is an example of a rob frame where they've, they've uh, cut into all the honey cells that were on this frame. Um, and robbing bees are not subtle. They don't clean up after themselves. So you see bits and pieces of, of wax on the bottom board. Or if you're using a, a debris board on the bottom, you'll see a lot of it, but the cells too cut and, and ripped open. So there may have been honey, uh, but by the time we look at it, the honey is gone. Um, so we have to take a look and see maybe if, it, if there was honey, maybe uh, it's gone because of robbing. So just a complicating fact. So I indicated this cluster can split. And so you might get a bunch of these small groupings of bees. You can see the butts out. Here's where the cluster was, a little bit of mold forming. Um, and, and on another frame, the same, and another frame the same, but three small clusters does not equal um, enough of a critical mass in any of the three. And we get that cold snap, like we're going to, we're experiencing these couple days and a colony that looked pretty good when we looked at them mid-month, if you looked in them, um, we might lose right now this time of year. And it's, it's because of the cluster splitting and, and the bees just not being able to keep warm enough and, and contact with enough honey to keep warm on these cool nights. So split clusters, um, bees in too small a grouping. And finally, our management for moisture is a critical factor. Uh, the bees had a, a fairly large brood area, as you can see. They've cannibalized some of the brood, but the brood here, if we pull these cappings off, there's a fully formed adult in there, uh, but wasn't able to emerge because the bees um, were very, very busy trying to keep warm. And in part, they were trying to keep warm because um, as the bees heat up the outside air, um, that warm air holds more moisture and warm air will rise as we know in our homes, going from the lower level to, a, to an upper level and then beehives, the same thing. The warm air goes up and if it hits a cold surface, it's not insulated here at the top or if you have a, a upper opening very close to the top of this top frame, then that, that warm air is wicked out and um, what is left is the moisture and the moisture will, will then condense uh, hitting that cold top as droplets. And the water droplets then rain back down on the bees in their cluster. The bees on the outside get wet, they start moving around. So the cluster integrity is messed up in the sense that they're moving way too much, moisture escapes, more moisture goes to the top, more droplets of moisture form, more water rains down on a bee, at bees in the cluster. And it's just a, a, a bad, um, loop uh, uh, feedback system of too much moisture and the bees just not being able to get rid of it. Um, what we can do is better insulate the top, close that upper entrance so that the moisture that goes up, that warm air then uh, splits and goes to the outside and runs down the outside of our boxes out after the outer frame, rather than condensing as droplets of moisture here in the top. Um, so uh, again, there might be a number of bees, uh, but um, again, not a lot of evidence of moisture. Uh, and then all the, the uh, moisture, even maybe a pool on a, on a, a bottom board, if you have one or the staining of the inner cover, um, the bottom of your moisture box or uh, staining the bottom 
uh, as evidence that it was we didn't do a good job with moisture management. All righty, uh, wet bees, uh, bees uh, will often then fall on that bottom board and that'll be a, a, a wet, soggy mess. And the, the bees just uh, don't have enough days when it's uh, you know, 55, 60 degrees to clean out all that mess. Um, so you get just a, a real soggy hive in the spring. However, as in the fall, most of what we have as a major factor for loss is still our bee mites. Here's a mite on a, on a, on a larval bee. Um, the evidence uh, we have uh, often, um, you know, uh, that those uh, uh, brood adults, uh, honey often still present. Um, the brood evidence shows the stress, that mold, that decay. Um, if we dig around in bees that are dead on the bottom board um, or in the dead cluster or even out front, you're going to see bees that likely have DWV. The, the real killer, of course, is not the mites. The mites are facilitating the, the, for the viruses, the DWV and the Varroa destructor virus, the, v, the VDV viruses, and the, the group of, that we call the acute B paralysis viruses, which is cashmere and Israeli um, virus, those, uh, et cetera. We'll see, um, we'll see mite frass. And the, 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 the one thing we want to, to make as a diagnosis is that the colony did not die with American fowl brood. And so the scales, the, the, the dry down brood is removable. With American fowl brood, um, that scale becomes gooey um, and, and um, does not dry down. We can't remove it. Um, uh, so this is our, again our PMS or, or parasitic mite brood sy syndrome. This is what it looks like in the spring. Here's honey. Here's where the brood area is, a pretty large brood area. Um, no adults or very few adults, virtually none on the bottom board. Um, and, and if we see clusters, we'll often see clusters um, that are pretty small. And, uh, but the cluster here often um, will stay on the brood area versus when bees are freezing and they're trying to keep in contact with that, um, they're too small a cluster trying to keep in contact with that honey. Um, we'll often see this type of a pattern as well. So these are leftover brood cells, brood that didn't hatch. Um, some of the cells have been opened by bees. Um, some of them are not, but we'll see often this pattern where if you notice, there's a lot here on the edge a lot of cells of brood that didn't hatch here on the edge of this brood area, there's still honey. There's some honey in the corners, not much, but there's still some. But this is because the adults were dying. They were dying because they were sick from mites. They were, were dying at a young age, so they didn't get through the winter. So as the nights got cold, the brood contracted, and then they started moving off of the brood itself. And so these brood cells here on the edge just didn't have a chance to hatch because they were not kept warm enough. A brood has to be kept warm enough, um, uh, roughly between 92 and 95 degrees. So this is a colony, had you looked in November, you would have seen that it was dead or just about dead in November, but we often then don't see this until we open our colonies in the spring. Um, so a big brood remains, they tried to rear the bees in the fall, those bees have got to live through the winter, got to survive six months, um, just weren't able to do so because of the declining number of adult bees. So this, um, this bee parasitic mite syndrome. And since this is both a fall and spring, let me summarize those conditions. So here's a brood frame. We have some mold developing on the outside here. Here's a cap brood. Um, what we'll see particularly in both fall and spring are too few adults. Um, we didn't have the adult coverage that was needed. And in the spring, particularly, we won't find the dead adults on the bottom board or out front because sick bees leave home. And those days when they could fly in February, those bees were sick from their mite infestations, the mite feeding on their uh, fat body, and they left home. So they, they didn't last until uh, March and April. The scattered, leftover, sunken, perforated cap brew. That's a mouthful. Uh, so these types of cells that we'll see in a brood area um, left over, these could all should have been bees that would help us uh, help the colony get through the winter. 
uh, could not because there wasn't a, weren't enough adult bees to uh, take care of them. Could have died in November, but we often again don't see it until the spring. The chewed down pupae, where we see that they have tried to uh, try to do some hygienic behavior, tried to clean up um, their mite numbers, but uh, uh, just couldn't get keep ahead of the mite numbers in the fall. Adults unable to emerge. Um, in this case, you have a, a fully formed adult. Its head is out, the antenna were out, maybe the front legs were out, but it just couldn't get out of the cell and join its sisters as a new adult. Um, and in part because of the, of the falling temperatures of the brood area uh, and because it's been fed on as a larva, uh, during, um, as a pupa during its pupa development by mites. Um, in the spring, we don't usually see the snot brood. This is a good characteristic in the fall. Um, I mentioned this characteristic, the, 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 these frames, uh, my last slide, I'll talk about, can we reuse this? And the short answer is yes. But um, the one thing you do want to check is make sure this is not a dead out from American fowl brood. And the easiest way to be able to tell that is, is are the remains removable? So can you take forceps, or in this case, a toothpick, go into one of these cells that did not emerge um, and take and remove what's left, the scale of what is left of the snot brood, the scale of, of the pupa that did not get to emerge as an adult. If it's removable, generally, generally, we can then eliminate American fowl brood as our causative agent and feel rest assured um, that we can reuse these frames of these dead outs. Um, the last characteristic is look at the color. Uh, European fowl brood imparts a yellowish color. Um, the larva uh, in the, in the, before they are capped are twisted in a cell. Uh, and those are, are when they're still live material, not as dead out, but live material. Um, so that's, uh, um, you know, beginning of symptoms that will help confirm that we have a European fowl brood situation. Um, and American fowl brood, um, the remains are not going to come out. They're going to be, even after they dehydrate, they're going to be gooey. Um, um, they're going to be ropey if they're still um, not completely dehydrated. If they've completely dehydrated, there's a scale that sticks to the bottom of the cell and we just can't get that scale out. It just so tightly adheres, it's incorporated into the bottom of the cell wall. And the colors are very different. Um, um, P, uh, snot brood, uh, this uh, cruddy brood is a grayish color, um, maybe even to black, uh, but uh, EFB yellowish and AFB uh, brownish or, or initially caramel colored onto a brownish color. So some guidelines in terms of both fall and spring of trying to say, you know, mite numbers, the bees were not able to keep ahead of their mite numbers. Um, our treatments either were not effective or the mite numbers got ahead of the type of treatment we selected to use. And our colonies just did not get through the winter period dying in the fall or now in the spring from this parasitic mite syndrome. Now, there are a few other factors that we, we can look at in terms of, of, of trying to assess that. We can have a number of disturbances to the colony, such as mice nest, mouse nest, um, uh, larger mammals, uh, 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 game animals, deer or, or penned animals, uh, uh, goats or cattle, knocking colonies over, uh, knocking tops off, for example. Um, those then um, expose that winter colony. Um, they have to eat more honey to stay warm because they're, they're not keeping a heat ball inside of the top box and they don't survive the winter. The, with the mice and um, further east in terms of shrews, um, these disturb the bees. The bees disturb, eat more food, so um, they have to have more food to be able to get through the winter. So colonies that are small on populations, colonies that, that don't have enough honey um, in the fall, um, with that continued disturbance of something like mice moving in and out on those cool nights um, can cause the, the colony to, to, to be a very small one that survives or uh, not survive because it's too small. Where we have small high beetle, that is another factor. Generally, we, we, we're seeing more of this on the West Coast but it's, it's not a significant factor. Small high beetle take away part of the colony from the bees. 
use up their resources of stored honey. And so bees have to compete with this small high beetle and don't do well against it. The other factor we can have are we have years where yellow jackets are a significant factor, something that uh, we were talking about, uh, you were talking about earlier in the meeting. And so the yellow jackets can uh, be a significant factor, particularly if you're open in a colony doing your mite treatment, yellow jackets are in and out of the colony more frequently. And again, um, they, they may then help weaken a, a weaker colony. So two with wax moth. Um, now, beekeepers will say wax moth or yellow jackets killed my colony. In actuality, um, there was other factors that were going on, likely mites, maybe not enough honey stores. And so <clears throat> the yellow jackets, the, pred the predators, the yellow jackets and the scavengers, such as small hive beetle, wax moth, uh, just finished the colony off. Okay? So here's our mouse moving in. The mice don't um, eat too many of the bees. They'll eat the pollen. They, of course, make a mess that then often results in drone comb. Here are ants moving in. Uh, again, um, they're not eating a lot of honey, but collectively over a, a period of time can have a factor in smaller colonies. So pests inside, the skunk and bear outside. We don't have this honey buzzard, but this is a honey buzzard carrying off a comb of Apis dorsata in Thailand. Um, uh, the few bees that we, few birds that we have that eat bees um, don't take enough to, to make a significant difference in terms of our of survivability. If, if, if we've got too many mockingbirds, too many thrushes, et cetera, eating too many of our colonies, uh, co bee colonies, it means we don't have enough bees. And so it's a matter of too, too weak a colony. Small high beetle, um, they slime um, part of the comb and, and part of the hive just doesn't become available. Here are the adults. And here's a, a county in Florida. You can see the slime even showing up on the outside. Thank goodness we don't have this as a significant factor here. And wax moth <clears throat> that didn't kill this county, but because the bees were not able to, uh, to uh, patrol their entire county, it got started on one side and then um, they gradually expanded. Um, the number of caterpillars successfully uh, growing <laughs> increased. And so uh, uh, the amount of nest available to the bees became smaller and smaller uh, because they just couldn't get in and clean up the mess. And so um, again, it didn't kill the colony, but it was a factor in, in, in making less of the colony available and making it harder for a small colony to survive. Let me mention two more. Um, one is absconding. Absconding is a, to us looks like a fall swarming, swarming in, in August, September, even into October. But the difference is in, in absconding, well, and we look back in an accounting, we'll see honey, we'll see in this case, some honey that they were ripening and good healthy looking brood. Um, they can't take the brood with them. They can only take honey what's in their honey stomach, uh, but no bees, the bees just gone. So we'll see this in, October. Um, um, it's not common in the spring. Um, we don't know why exactly bees abscond, but certainly high mite numbers is one factor. Ants is another factor. Too much looking at colonies, too much smoke, uh, too much disturbance, uh, moisture, all those are factors that may lead to absconding. Not common um, as you go further south, a, a significant factor. And finally, bees don't need a queen to get through the winter, don't need it at all, but they're gonna need it in the spring. So if you've got a queen that's laying nothing but drone brood uh, for whatever reason was not properly fertilized or uh, was uh, uh, too cold or too hot, um, the sperm was not viable um, and is only able to lay drone brood as you see here, drone brood and worker cells. Um, this colony may be a survivor, but it's a, it's a walking ghost because it's just, of course, not going anywhere in the spring. And then that may be seen in spotty brood, although often we equate the spotty brood with the, the PMS. So spring, spring is coming. Pretty soon we're going to be having to think about adding some more room, about looking on, in terms of the Goldilocks effects of uh, strengthening weak counties, uh, cutting back the strong ones. Before too long, we'll have to get those supers out of storage and, and then start supering up our colonies. And then we got the real dilemma because then we got to handle all that honey that our, gonna, our survivors are going to produce this spring. Look at uh, um, some of our factors in terms of, um, of our evaluation of spring colonies, the, those that have not survived and 
the beginning of what we're going to have to be thinking about with those that do survive, well, what we might do for our management. At this point, those are the comments I want to, to discuss. I know we want to bring Tim on to talk about uh, uh, the uh, survey, but perhaps there's time to answer some questions. Uh, wow, there's, I don't know if those are questions in the chat for you. <laughs> uh probably related to other things there is there are several okay. questions in the chat and you do have time do we please? okay yeah okay please, um th i think there's probably a lot of um curiosity okay let's see i freeze frames with honey to kill wax moths okay then wash them that's a good idea uh, rainy day bees check out monthly column a two green okay Connecting the link, correcting links, PDF to register. Um, um, Tracy, I'm not seeing them ever relate to this. Shoners B, Kathy, yes, Tim. What the heck happened in 2019? We had a terrible, terrible year for raising queens in California. Our queens in 2019 were just terrible. And so we had a lot of loss that winter. Are the theories on the geographic differences in loss uh, theories? Um, not an awful lot of research. Um, and in our surveying, um, you saw that they go up and down every year. And if you look at the Be Informed, some years uh, losses in Washington are heavy. The last couple of years, 30% or more in the Be Informed survey. And, and um, you know, five years ago, they were in a 20% range. Um, um, are there theories related to it? Um, there are a lot of factors that, that possibly can be related, uh, but um, most of them have not been, and there's no good research on most of them and to try to te um, tease out the different ones. So it wasn't that the year we had a bunch of, come on, move down here. I'm trying to move my scroll down. A bunch of snow, come on here. In late February into March, spotty memory, but gosh, I hate snow. Well, <laughs> I was in Arizona um, week before last and, and uh, there was still snow on Mount Lemon. So they even had snow down there. What does the inside of the hive look like if queen died? Um, it, it will, there just won't be any brood come spring. Um, beginning in January, uh, bees start rearing brood. And if you don't see brood, so if you had a chance to look in February, you should have seen brood in any of your colonies. If not, then uh, likely the queen died and the bees just, just sort of run down. So there's just really none left at all. I lost one so far and a suspect dead queen was the reason for their, their demise. No, the queen, you know, the queens go, they go through perfectly well without queens. But now in the spring, um, you've got to have replacement bees. So now we'll see them dead in the spring. Um, so yeah, I mean, we got to have queens. Um, anyone else remember if that was a snow year? It was a terrible year for raising uh, queens. And that was a lot of our problems. If you see any eggs, she's been there in the last three days. Exactly, that's how we assess in terms of our colony. Uh, but this time of year, um, particularly going into a cold spell like this, they, they cannibalize. Um, if they don't get fresh pollen coming in every three, four days or so, they'll start cannibalizing their brood pretty quickly this time of year. Uh, but you should see cat brood at least, um, uh, dying over winter when she isn't laying. No, they don't need that. The, they, they go into winter without a queen. They don't need it. It's, it's coming out of, of winter that they need the queen. They don't need it over a winter. Da, 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 da. Uh, what was that one? Would there be? Why oh, this is bulky here? Come on. <laughs> complete lack of brood, usually. Yep, complete lack of brood. So, uh, uh, Peter, nice answer. Complete lack of brood, yes. Queenless spring hives can go laying worker two. Uh, yeah, they can, but not right away. Um, they're gonna cannibalize that brood initially. So, so this time of year, you would not see laying worker 
Oh, not likely. Um, you're going to, but you will see it a little bit later. Yes, you'll see that in, in uh, the end of March and April. I built electric fences from the stuff brought at a garage. Uh, Fall City. I, we had a mama bear. Yes, destroy sixty eye. Oh God, that hurts. A few years back, we don't know that there were bears there until we showed up, and they were there chomping away. They. Um, that is the issue, and of course, our bear numbers are increasing, and so um, that's a factor. Now, now bears are not um, a spring kill. Um, often they we they'll not show up in our hives until mama bear kicks them out uh, because of the new cubs that 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 uh, have been born over the winter hibernation period, and so it's the, the it's the males, the males that get kicked out. They're the ones that create most of our problem with hives, and they're hungry. They're hungry come spring, and and uh, they're not getting love at, in, the, in the cave with mom. Um, and so those are the ones that create the problem. They will do that in the fall, of course, too, as, they, as they're trying to build up fat reserves. Sorry for the what a disaster, yeah. Lost a couple of hives and woodware to hives one year, hence the electric fence and fortress gate fence we now have. The issue is you've got to put a fence up before the bears come. Um, after the fact, after they've discovered that, they will they will come back night after night, and usually, um, you've got to move them out of that area. Um, uh, the The main thing with electric fences is uh, is they keep testing it, the, the, particularly those males, the male living in the area. They keep testing it, and, and if you lose charge because of a branch or whatever shorting it out, uh, they they'll find that. And so, even though you might have electric fence, you might still lose them. Unfortunately, they're formidable enemies. Uh, lost a couple of hives and what, okay, we said that one. Anyone want to uh, open up and, and ask, a, go off mute and ask a question? Best strategy for moisture management, um, uh, insulate the top, get rid of that top entrance, absolutely. You've got to want to make that moisture spread out and not form as droplets on um, the underside of your moisture box or on the on the, on, a, on an inner cover that you might have on top of the colony. If you use the the uh, moisture quilt, um, it's okay to have your your entra your um, your moisture be vented, but you don't want to vent the top box of your colony because that they you want a heat sink the a big nice heat sink to uh, to uh, to build up in there, it's a little bit like you know you can leave your front door all front door open all winter and open up a couple windows upstairs, and and pay a lot of money to heat. But most of us are going to close those windows upstairs and try to open the door only when we go in or out. And yell at the kids for leaving the door open and 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 everything else. Uh, you know we want that heat sink in our houses, and so do bees and their their beehive. So insulation to the top. R5, uh, many of you, as you start getting away from the water, R10 is even better. Uh, so about an inch to two inches of insulation in the top. What do I do with an abandoned hive with two deeps, and two supers? Gosh. With all frames containing nectar, honey, uh, dead brood, et cetera. Freezer, every frame should go into the freezer. You don't want honey fermenting in any of those frames with honey in it because fermented honey for colonies in the spring is not a good idea. You want good, uh, good honey source. Um, all that brood in there, um, if you see any signs of wax moth into the freezer, uh, only, only a couple days. So push all the salmon aside and the blueberries to one side and put your frames in and then put them out um, and, then, and then bag them at that point with a, a sturdy uh, uh, a trash bag. Uh, then they can go on strong colonies. Um, the honey, the frames with honey, as long as it's not fermenting, is a great uh, way to bolster those weaker colonies um, and the just right colonies. Um, the stronger colonies, you can put a put a whole bunch of frames on them. And as the just right colonies get stronger than the frames that have that, those ugly PMS frames, you can put a couple in at a time. Well, we wanna balance using those old frames and getting the frames cleaned up 
with building or uh, drawing new foundation frames. So that's gonna be a major activity as well. Um, older frames that are dark, uh, hold them up to the light. You can't see anything through them, call those frames, particularly if you think you've had them in service more than, than, than four, four or five years. Can any correlation be made with regard to major fire seasons effect on bees in Washington? We've looked, um, we've looked in uh, Oregon um, in terms of, of that factor and have not found a, a correlation yet. Still, uh, still doing some looking. Um, it does, it, it like uh, some of our pesticides, it causes the loss of a generation or more of brood. So it certainly does weaken the colonies um, and uh, um, they don't forage for a while. Um, as long as they have water accessible during that time of the heavy smoke, uh, uh, then they seem to have been okay, other than losing a, a generation or so of brood. And depending on when the smoke comes, the uh, bees can afford to lose a generation of brood. You know, we can afford a pesticide kill. We don't want to have them, but we can, depending on what time of year. At what point would they turn laying workers? So oh, it's, it's a, a period of time of, of roughly five to six weeks there are always workers laying some eggs, but the worker bees are policing them. The, uh, the nurse age bees are policing them. There's always some always present, very small number. Um, when can we actually really start seeing it to, uh, to uh, the small size drones in the worker cells? Usually it's, a, it's a, a period of time of a month to five to six weeks that we've, the colony's been without a queen. But they will, some, some bees will start almost immediately laying eggs. And any care we, we, we made regard to major fire season? I think I answered that. Am I down at the end of the last of the zip, z, z, uh, chats? I think so. Anyone have to want to unmute? <laughs> we still don't have any time, Kit? Yeah, that's um, wonderful. You've scrolled and scrolled. Um, <laughs> so Did I miss any? any last anyone person is question? click clarifying about closing the upper entrance. And I, I was unclear about that too. You're saying that you you dislike the idea of an upper entrance through the winter because the moist the heat of get leaves. But what about the moisture, the, the buildup of moisture letting it release? If you have an insulated top, that moisture then um, hits that top. The moisture that top is warm, as warm as the moisture air. And so then it goes to the sides. And so the moisture accumulates at the side of the colony, uh, may on a warm day, then may drip as, as moisture down to the bottom more. But it doesn't stay at the top because you've insulated the top. If you put an upper entrance in there, you take away that heat sink. You, you destroy the heat sink like, like we try to do in our homes, create a heat sink. Um, you're not gonna open your windows tonight um, because that's gonna rob your house of heat. And if you have an open, open entrance, um, the bees haven't filled in with propolis, that's robbing their home of that heat at the top of the colony. Now, upper entrances uh, that are below that heat sink or upper entrance related to a quilt box, uh, um, you know, an insulation board at the top of an absorbent material is okay um, because uh, I, you have, and you'll get a lot more, less moisture into your moisture box um, if you don't have that upper entrance. Hmm. I've um, always had upper entrances, so this is... Depends where the entrance is. It good depends twist. really where the entrance is, yeah. I can, um, I can send you the, a couple of references. Um, the, uh, the, the concept is uh, a ventilating hive versus condensing hive. So use your Google search engine. engine. You'll see, see, see some articles by a fellow from Connecticut, Hesbeck, Bill Hesbeck. And um, the major issue uh, discussing all this is a fellow by the name of Mitchell. He's, a, he's an engineer. Um, but, but if you go on any of the blogs of some of the Canadians, Etienne Tardif, uh, 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 Ian Stepler, you'll see that uh, how they manage that moisture in their colonies at the top. Ventilating versus moist versus moisturizing. Condensing. Condensing. Oh, condensing. Thank you. 
and I can, and I'll, uh, I don't have them right handy to put a chat right now, but I'll send for, send it to you. So maybe you could put it in the next newsletter or we could append it to this talk or whatever you want. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, well, if we've wound up with questions, then um, I guess I have to take this opportunity to thank you very much, Dewey, and um, thought that was a wonderful, I, I liked how you had uh, the great photographs that really represented what you were talking about because uh, the first time you see that evidence of mite damage, you don't really know what you're looking at. And um, it took me a while to catch on that it was pretty obvious, <laughs> but I didn't know what I was looking at. So that description and hopefully people could connect those, that, um, that clue. Um, so um, I will uh, open up the, the, the floor to Tim Hyatt. And um, we have a great crowd still on board here. Hopefully uh, people are interested in what's going on with uh, the legislative, the legal side of life with these. Hi, Tim. And um, Hi, Kit. yeah, we can listen to uh, this. I, I think Tim would really like this to be interactive where uh, the people who aren't really understanding the context of what what has been presented because it's pretty confusing. The word choice is, I think, um, as clear as mud. So am I right, Tim? You'd, you'd like to maybe I'll summarize. And Yeah, you're right. It's it's um, the survey isn't as clear as it ought to be. We struggled with that. And I had to bow out toward the end because I couldn't get folks to make it any clearer. Um, let me start first off just with the general announcement that Kit mentioned at the beginning. Any beekeepers with bees in Bothell, please get in touch with me or Kit and we can uh, get you in touch with someone from the city of Bothell who wants to work with the city council to institute bee regulations for the city. They don't have any yet and there was an incident last year so they want to uh, begin having some rules on the keeping of bees, placement, and so forth. And so this is an opportunity if you have bees in Bothell to uh, get involved in that process and have the uh, rules make sense. So often we complain about laws and regulations that we don't like. Well, here's a chance to influence those to make them something you would like. So again, get, a, get in touch with me or with Kit about that if you're from Bothell. Okay, the survey. A couple of years ago, a bill passed the legislature um, organizing a pollinator health task force. I, Jennifer Short, and a few other people have been on that task force for a couple of years now. And uh, <clears throat> about this time last year, I was frantically sending emails to everybody, all the beekeepers in the state saying, we've got to oppose this, this uh, provision that's being pushed by the pesticide companies. And and we were successful in getting that provision stopped and instead it morphed into let's survey the beekeepers and see what they want and that's what we're looking at now is the survey that came out it was authored by uh, Katie Buckley mostly she's the chair of the task force Tim Lawrence uh, WSU Extension tried to uh, make the survey statistically valid and improve it and I don't know that he was successful he suggested a randomized sample and then follow up with people who didn't fill out the survey because you'd have everything tracked. And I don't think this current survey is tracked at all. I think anybody who wants to fill it out can fill it out. But in any case, there, there are three essential issues, even though the survey itself doesn't sound very informative. Um, one issue is whether we should have a state apiarist again or not. And on that question, it's uh, whatever you think. Um, I'm a commercial beekeeper myself, and I have bad memories of the years when the state apiarist was overbearing and abused his power and was a thorn in our sides. But I'm sure people in, in some of the smaller clubs really enjoyed having a state apiarist because he would come around and show people this is what foul brood looks like. This is what 
chalk rude looks like and, and would help and help people that way and that's fine um but the the uh the clubs do a lot of that work now um so whether we have a state apiarist or not will be determined by our our votes i hope it's going to feed into what the legislature is told the preference by the Pollinator Task Force will be. Um, another prov uh, pro provi proviso that we're looking at is whether WSDA should red have beekeepers register their apiaries with the state. Especially on the east side of the state, there's been a lot of complaints about beekeepers plopping down bees right next to other people's bees and ruining the forage for everybody. And overcrowding has been a more and more of a problem as people try to have more bees. And um, many beekeepers have complained. On the other hand, a lot of beekeepers don't want anyone knowing where their bees are. Um, often you'll have a great bee yard and you'll have a, a spot that nobody else knows about. You've got good forage, your bees thrive there, and, and you don't want anybody, anyone else's bees near them. So that is a, a reason you might not want them. Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota have uh, high registration requirements, high location requirements, but they have been ex in existence for a long time. And to impose that kind of a system on top of what we already have, which is just beekeepers have permission from landowners to place their bees would be pretty hard. North Dakota or South Dakota has a two mile limit. You have to be two miles away from any other beehive. And there's way more apiaries that are closer than that. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. There's another provision about lice or about registering apiary locations with a third party. And this is mirroring what's done in California. And this is the one that's being put forward by the pesticide companies. None of the beekeepers in the pollinator task force wanted to see this. We all argued against it. The, the pesticide company lobbyist was arguing for it. And I even was able to get some of the growers on the committee to argue against it as well once I explained the point of view. And still, it, somehow it got through and was not eliminated. So I think the pesticide lobbyists have more power than I give them credit for. So what this provision would do is would have beekeepers register, register their locations in a, with a third party, usually through a phone app or a computer app. And then that would allow the pesticide applicators to uh, consult the database and let the beekeeper know before they spray. Now, who wouldn't be, want to, who would be against getting notified before you're sprayed? Well, actually, as a beekeeper who keeps bees around lots of sprays, I have good relations with my neighbors, with my landowners. We work together, we inform each other. They let us know when there's gonna be applications and we can make appropriate steps. I know when they're gonna spray because I've had bees there for a while and I'll have the bees gone before they even need to spray. Potatoes are a terrible crop for sprays, and I know not to keep bees around potatoes in that, in that time of the year. But the reason the pesticide applicators want this uh, requirement is that similar to California or North Dakota, that would enable them to consult the database, send an automated text, and that would be all they have to do. When my landowner calls me and asks me, what are we going to do about this crop? I've got a spray and your bees are there. We'll work out something. It may be that I need to move the bees soon. It may be that uh, they can apply the spray after the sun goes down so the bees aren't flying. There are workarounds we can do. We can work together and cooperate. My experience in the Midwest under a system like this is I'll get an automated text or a, a, a voicemail, a recorded message saying, we plan to spray at this place and this place tomorrow. And I think that's, that's a nice effort, but the problem is that if you are not able to respond timely to that message, like say you're gone for the weekend and they need to spray tonight, or you're ill or you're, you know, you're in another state or something, um, your bees will get killed 
And so uh, let me just go over with you how that works. If you do have a spray kill, you call the Department of Agriculture. They'll send, they'll send an investigator out and they'll do an investigation. I've had three of them so far and none of them could point the finger at any one person. They could identify the chemicals, but not the people who sprayed it. But if they had found the actual person who was guilty, the state would maybe find them, but still the beekeeper wouldn't get any benefit. So um, in order for the beekeeper to get reimbursed for that loss, they have to sue, they have to go to court. And you go to court and the attorney for the grower or the applicator would stand up and say, well, this person received notice, it's their fault they didn't move their bees. And, and that is the reason I, I really don't want to see apiary location registration because in effect, it will be taking the responsibility for protecting bees from sprays away from the pesticide applicators and putting it on us, the beekeepers. We, are the bee, we will be the ones responsible for updating the database. And if we don't do it timely, it's our fault for not doing it. Or they'll send out their automated messages. And if we don't get out of their way, it's our fault for not doing so. Um, and that's my main disagreement with having um, an apiary location database run by a private party or by the state for that matter. The one, a run, one run by the state could be used for the same purpose. Now, good relations with land, landowners goes a long ways in protecting honeybees. I think you all know that if you have bees other than in your backyards, uh, having an open communication and uh, and a one-on-one -on -one relationship. That, that's all you need really to take care of your bees. You know, barring someone doing something really dumb who's a neighbor or something. So those seem to be the three main issues in, in the uh, survey. Um, they didn't really frame it that way. <laughs> the, the survey was a little bit oblique that way. Um, we seem to have been a little bit primed to answer the questions that, do you feel it's a concern that bees get sprayed with pesticides? Well, obviously we're all concerned with that, but that doesn't mean we want to surrender our protection for liability in exchange for thinking that we're being protected. So Peter has a question. Yeah, Tim, so the one, the, the part of the survey, I actually found the absolute most confusing uh, and I have already filled it out, but it was really, really confusing for me was, I think it was the last question where they, they were like, how much would you pay per hive for each of these services? And the, the, what the options they gave you ranged from, I think, 50 cents to like $10. And I was like, okay, the apiarist is that, are, are we tacking $10 per hive? Is that what you're saying? Like when I register or to have the apiarist out? And then there was the same question for uh, the two um, location registration options. And I was like, okay, am I now paying you to force me to register my hives or register the locations of my hives? Yes, um, the, the inspector one I think is anticipated to be uh, a pay for fee service. You know, a, a, pay, a pay, pay fee to get the service. Um, what's that worth to you? It's a gauge of interest in, in that service. And the, uh, the state running a apiary database isn't free. We would have to ask the legislature for money to do it. And how much money would beekeepers be willing to pay to have that service? Um, to have a third party do it, that's not free either. Um, tens of thousands of dollars to set it up and about $10,000 annual in maintenance fees to have that service. It currently exists in California where my bees are right now and it's next to worthless. Uh, my one of my brothers in California turned off voicemail so he doesn't get messages from those people anymore because there's really nothing he can do. Um, he, instead of he just works with the, the landowners and between him and the landowners, they take care of the bees. So yes, the, the dollar amounts were there as a gauge of interest. So if, 
if they if the, res, the response in the survey came back, oh, people are willing to pay ten dollars a hive to have an apiary database, then you know there would probably be a a fee tacked onto registration or something like that. Uh, for a bee inspector, there might be you know, a per day per day or per hive or something like that. It, that all the details haven't been figured out. This was mainly to um, gauge interest. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate the answer. Uh, there was there was an option for other, and I could enter zero. You know, yes, I mean, that's, that is I what I did as well. Kit. Oh, you you saw that option because it's it wasn't real obvious. Well, where's the nothing? Because I don't want to pay for this at all. Yeah, I was like on the. I mean, for the APR inspect, that's worth something to me. I will totally pay you for that if you know we're doing this on the location registration, yes, it's gonna cost money, but it's not something that I actually want. So it's not something I want to pay for. It's benefiting the pesticide company more than it's benefiting me. The pesticide company should be paying for it. Well, I right. like the idea of an inspector, except the way they describe the function of the inspector makes it sound like he's much more of an administrative person or she than, um, than a helpful cohort like in the old days, I think that's really what they did. And I remember having the UC Davis apiarist um, here. She was wonderful and extremely knowledgeable, wonderful pal. But I don't know if that's the same kind of person that they're thinking fills the role. It depends on who you get. Um, mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a decent relationship with the previous Washington State apiarist. And personally, I enjoyed him. He was a nice person, but in the application of policy and in regulation, it was onerous for a beekeeper to 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 do his work with that kind of regulation and uh, heavy-handed activity. You know, I remember when I was a kid going out with my dad, and the state inspector would have to come and make sure we didn't have felbrut. And he would make us burn hives, even though it was common at the time to scorch the inside of a box. If you found foul brood, you could keep the box, just scorch the inside with fire and keep the box. And oh, no, no, it must be burned. And, you know, it, regulations take away our freedom to a degree, but a good beekeeper knows that you do have to deal with disease, but you don't have to have someone from the state tell you how you deal with disease or how you deal with the issues you have in your hive. I'm sure there's people who could use the help. You know, the teachers on the club level do a lot of that. That's that's what they're excellent at. Um, this year, I've had relationships with uh, South Dakota and the North Dakota state apiarists. And it just depends on who gets it. The South Dakota apiarist is just a gem of a guy. It's helpful and uh, open and ready to talk and chat. Uh, not a bureaucrat, not a regulator. Uh, the North Dakota State Apiarist is not quite that good, but still helpful and, and not there to restrict what you do, but they're, to, they're there to help you be better at what you do. And so that's kind of the danger of a state apiarist. You, you might get somebody excellent or you might not. <laughs> hmm. It's a balancing act. It is. Yeah. Maybe if they let the beekeepers choose them, <laughs> not that that's going to happen. Well, we had a, um, an incident last summer where someone was had positive results for American fowl brood, and it was up north. You know, it was in the city limits, and it was how do we let people know about this so that it stays contained and we manage this and an apiarist would have stepped in and been very helpful in that situation. But, um, you know, so many people are not members of clubs or not registered. So there was no way to really communicate that. And that, that was the first time, that's the only time that I wished that there was a professional that we could bring in to help. Um, <clears throat> I, I think in your club, there's people who do know what Falbert looks like, right? Right, but but the the the, the apiarists around that contagious hive needed to be notified. 
that they needed to be watching out in their bees, right? So that I, you know, 20 miles away, don't wind up with it in three years. That's what I was thinking. You know, it's like, we need to contain this problem. And how do we communicate with each other? That was, that was hard. Were those case, was that case of AFB in a club member's hive? Um, yeah, it was. Well, then it's through the club that you would communicate. Well, but that would only be with club members. Mm -hmm. And lots more people have bees than belong to PSBA. And that's true. Yeah. So it's a tricky wicket. I don't know if you'd use <laughs> drones or something. I don't know. It, it just seemed like it was, so, it was pretty scary because containing that disease is um, desirable. Yes, absolutely. And uh, EFB, AFB, so many diseases are transmitted by the movement of comb. And so if you buy comb, used comb from somebody, you need to talk to their friends. Do they keep clean equipment? Do they burn stuff that's suspicious? Um, yeah, that should be part of your due diligence. Okay. That's a great point. Does anyone have questions to just unmute and um, speak up or raise your hand in a chat? I was on Facebook uh, a couple of days ago since the survey came out and someone posted, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how, how, how are we to believe you that these, these things are true? Uh, how, how come estate mm -hmm. acres might not be a, a good thing to have? And it's experience that I'm talking from. Um, you know, my, my family and I run bees in California, Washington, North and South Dakota, and they deal with regulation in all those states. And in our experience, California and Washington are the places that it, it just gives you a headache. <laughs> um, and I've enjoyed Washington since we haven't had a state apiarist, but yes, Kit, you're right. There are times when a state apiarist would be good. And I'm looking for WSU extension to step into more of that role. Um, WSU is hiring a new extension person for bees. Um, I, I am aware that they're down to four candidates and they may be hired later this year. And that person well, will be 50%. 50 that would be extension. great. Yeah, they'll, they'll be based out of the Othello Bee Lab and they'll be 50% extension, 50% research. And they'll be available to come talk to clubs. They'll I hope, you know, it's up to them to make their own program, but available to, you know, to spend time in bee yards. So anyway, any, any questions or any concerns? Uh, once you fill out the form, I guess you can't open it up again. Actually, it, I think you can. Oh, really? Um, Someone... Yeah, you can fill it out as many times as you want, I believe. Oh, cool. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that Tim Lawrence, you know, WSU Extension from Island County, uh, great bee guy, um, was trying to help get the survey designed. And his suggestion was that we, we sample a certain percentage of uh, small, medium, and large beekeepers and, and keep track of their responses. In other words, every survey would be numbered and, and unique to that person. And then the non-respondents would be then contacted by phone or by mail to say, please you know, respond. And then this, the, these samples that would be chosen randomly would be representative of all, be, of all the beekeepers. Uh, that way they, they wouldn't have to, to uh, have everyone fill out the survey. But apparently Katie didn't take that advice because I see nothing in the survey that's unique to me or to anyone else. It's just a link to a uh, survey monkey survey. There's no unique identifier. No, I, I didn't see one either, no. So I think you can fill it out as many times as you'd like. Vote early and vote often, right? So it seems, this is Maureen, and it does seem to be tracking uh, what you're using as your sign in. So I had to go from Chrome to Safari to access it again. It wouldn't let me access. So okay. that, that's, that's just Jeff, Jeff Seenbergen told me to do that. So thank you, Jeff. Um, could you also talk about some 
situations that are available for people who do want to get involved in the pollinator policies of Washington State and noxious weed boards and all of that, that's really, really important right now. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, for years, beekeepers have complained about the state noxious weed board and the county noxious weed boards who wipe out forage. <laughs> the, the cattle guys want grass only and they don't want flowers. Some, some flowers can be bad for cattle and for horses, the ones that are thistles. And so they don't, they want to spray everything. And so there's, you know, people have lost good forage locations in the foothills, in the Cascades, in the Blue Mountains, all over the state. And as the legislative person for WASBA, I've met with the state noxious weed board and they are a bunch of hard-headed good old boys. <laughs> Um, at least the ones that are that have been on there the longest. Uh, it's a generational change, I think, that's going to change them. Um, they just don't want, you know, forage. What do you need forage for? It's all for cattle. It's for livestock. So what we can do as beekeepers is we can get involved in county weed boards. That's an elected position, and you can help set the agenda for weed control in your county to encourage less radical weed control. Now in your area in Northwest Washington, you may not have, or in the Seattle Puget Sound area, you may not have that much, um, that much conflict with, with livestock people. Although the Eastern part of the sound, you start to get up into the foothills. Yeah, you may. The big, con the big concern we have is that they'll come in with spray planes and carpet bomb acres and acres and acres trying to control a little patch and if beekeepers want to get involved in a, in a county weed board you could be the voice of, of reason and and you know let them know that hey you, you don't have to kill everything that's flowering in a square mile to control this little half acre patch of yellow star thistle uh, that's one thing we can do um, Another thing we can do is serve on the Pollinator Task Force. WSDA, the State Department of Ag, has this task force that I've been serving on. This survey comes as a result of the work of the task force. And if you want to find out what the stakeholders have to say on pollinator health, let me know and I can hook you up with Katie. Or if you know Katie Buckley, ask her and we can get you on the committee. Um, the more the merrier, especially the more beekeepers. Um, the task force is composed of beekeepers, native pollinator advocates, conservationists, the state fish and wildlife, uh, Department of Natural Resources, Department of Transportation, representatives from row crops, from berries, from seed producers, from tree fruit, um, and the Department of Agriculture. And the task force is charged with um, trying to come up with ideas to make Washington better for pollinators. And uh, yeah, more beekeeper voices on the pollinator task force, the better. Another thing you can do is get involved in the legislative committee that I'm the chair of with WASPA. And what I do is, I used to go to Olympia until COVID, but uh, WASPA pays for a legislative consultant to keep us abreast of everything going on in Olympia that touches honeybees and keeps me up to speed on everything. And then I can organize the grassroots to uh, push good proposals and defeat bad ones. The last one we passed was that beekeeper liability bill. And I'm really proud of that. Um, it's, it's a really cool bill. And I, it's one of the very few in the country that recognizes that bees should have Bees and beekeepers should have more protection under the law than, you know, a, whatever other normal thing you might find that subject to liability. Um, so the the legislative committee is uh, a group of people that we work together to try to come up with these good ideas, come up with strategies to defeat bad ideas. We try to be available to testify when needed. The legislative season is January to 
June or January to April, depending on whether it's a long or short session. We're in a short session this year and things are moving fast. I think March, we're gonna wind up something like that. Um, the legislative committee of, of WASPA is, is who does that. And it, that's really rightly a function of, of WASPA because we're representing the state's beekeepers. So those are three things you can do if you're interested in getting involved in that kind of thing. Representing pollinators, that sounds pretty fabulous. It is, and the task force is, it was a huge education to me. In the legislature the last few years, it's been a lot like uh, the public perception has been a lot like the legislature's perception that honeybees are endangered and we need to save the bees. And now it, the tide is changing a little bit to where actually honeybees aren't in danger of extinction. People can breed more honeybees. People can raise more honeybees. It's the native bees that are going to be endangered because they have no one managing them. And uh, it's gotten to the point where people like Xerxes Society actually, a few years ago, they were capitalizing on the popularity of honeybees and save the bees, and they were doing fundraising campaigns around it. Today, they're saying, oh no, honeybees are non-native. They're an invasive species to North America, and they need to be restricted in where they can be placed and be kept away from native bees because they compete with native bees and reduce their populations. That's what they say. So it, it's been really interesting to get to know these people in, in, in the task force and find out who has an ax to grind on whom. Yeah, there's give and take there. And it's, it's hard when, I don't know, I don't know. That's challenging conversation. It is, um, and it was. I was really disappointed in Xerxes because uh, this was starting to be an issue. People were bringing it up. More and more researchers were expressing concern. There's, there have not been, in my, in my knowledge, there's not been a study come out and say a pathogen cross from honeybees to bumblebees. Um, there's, there are studies that, are, that suspect it. They've detected deform wing virus on blossoms visited by honeybees that bumblebees also visit. And they've found deformed wing virus in bumblebees, but there's no evidence so far showing that they came from honeybees. They might have been already existing. Um, and so the Logan Bee Lab, the USDA Logan Bee Lab is in the middle of a three year study. This is their third year of it to, to directly compare honeybees with native bees to see what impact or influence they have back and forth. And Xerxes agreed to not pursue anything in the meantime while the study was going. Well, two years into the study, Xerxes filed a petition with the Federal Department of Agriculture to shut down honeybee access to public lands on the, in the forests, the, the national forests, because they were gonna compete with the native bees. They didn't wait for the study to finish. They wanted to push their agenda, regardless of what the science said. That was very disappointing to me. But these are the things that were, you know, the, in the legislative committee that we are working with. These people have their own agendas and we try to uh, find a middle way. But ultimately we have to preserve honeybees because they're a blast to have and they're an essential part of the food system until the population is so tiny that you don't need to pollinate crops that native pollinators can do it. Until that happens, we're going to have to have honeybees so we can have fruit and vegetables and berries. And so, anyway. Yeah, it's a big anyway. Yeah, um, comments in the chat. Someone said that there was a, there was someone that came unannounced. The prior apiarist came, the state um, apiarist would show up unannounced and that's interesting. I guess that could happen. Oh yeah, definitely, it, it does happen. I've gotten inspection reports from state apiarists. Um, you know, this is the condition of the bees we found on this date that we visited the, this apiary. I knew, never knew they were there. 
Fortunately, they didn't find anything bad. So that was good. Yeah, that would be nerve wracking for sure. Um, and Peter said he's had run-ins with Xerxes and it's been a problem. Hmm. Yes, I, they, they're trying to, dis currently beekeepers do have the right to petition Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Natural Resources for apiaries on their ground. There's a procedure for that to happen. And they're trying to discourage beekeepers from using that procedure to protect the natives, they say. You know, the Xerxes or a group like that came out with a statistic saying that around a, a honeybee apiary, a honeybee, honeybees are so such good foragers that they remove from the environment enough pollen and nectar to support a ridiculously high number of native bees. It was a million bees or something. And, and that's, that's such a deceptive fact because mm -hmm. you don't find a million bees in the foraging area of a, of a single apiary. It's ridiculous. So. No, that's a dramatic statement. Well, does anybody have further questions? I, I love your, um, your review, Tim. It's really great to have you here speaking because you, you bring so much um, worldliness, right? We're working in different places and you have a lot of um, wisdom. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. You know, uh, the stuff I do in Olympia is, is useful for all beekeepers, I hope. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is that there's 10, 30, 40 times more small beekeepers than there are large beekeepers. And so when all of us speak with the United Voice, we are heard in Olympia. The legislative people have told me they've been surprised at how many people mobilize when there's an issue that, that affects beekeepers. And so it was it was amazing last summer how much energy came forward when you asked for it. I was I was really heartened by that. It must have felt good to you. It sure did. It was really neat to um, get get as much attention paid to to me as a representative of beekeepers as was being paid to the. Uh, pesticide lobbyists, <laughs> at least Touché. in that one issue. <laughs> yeah. uh, lobbyists. Um, okay, well, um, it's been a great meeting and um, I don't even know, it's just past nine o'clock and uh, I guess we can hang around and visit or sign off. I, I'll stop recording. Um, and uh